thank you all for joining us for this panel on Community Partnership for Sustainability. I'm Angela Potochnik. I'm Professor of Philosophy here at the University of Cincinnati, and I'm the Director of UC's Center for Public Engagement with Science. So the Center for Public Engagement with Science, or PUSE as we call it, uh, because that's a mouthful, has recently launched an, an initiative focused on sustainability uh, with support and guidance from the Office of Research and Research 2030. The University of Cincinnati strives to be a regional and a national leader on climate and sustainability research, education, and action. Pew Sustainability is an initiative to highlight sustainability research here at UC, second, to support community partnerships with sustainability goals, and third, to host public-facing events about sustainability. This event contributes to those last two goals of cultivating and supporting UC's community partnerships and hosting public-facing events about sustainability. We've also just launched a series of sustainability highlights videos, interviewing UC faculty from fields ranging from engineering and education to psychology and communication, whose research focuses on sustainability. You can watch those interviews on the Pew's website or on the Pew's YouTube channel. I encourage you to do so. I think they've just been, they've turned out really nicely. So moving on to today's events, today's panel features speakers from five organizations that are absolutely crucial to sustainability efforts in Greater Cincinnati. Our speakers include Connie O'Connor, who's Education Director at Cincinnati Nature Center, Oliver Croner, who's Sustainability Manager for the City of Cincinnati Office of Environment and Sustainability, Melinda Cruyer, Executive Director of Confluence Water Technology Innovation Cluster, Kelsey Hawkins Johnson, Community Outreach Coordinator for Groundwork Ohio River Valley, and then finally, Ryan Mooney Bullock, Executive Director of Green Umbrella. Each of our panelists is, panelists is going to give an overview of their organization's work related to sustainability, partnership activities that they've cultivated in their organization, and perhaps new opportunities for students or researchers or others to partner or support their efforts. I'm going to now introduce our first speaker, Connie O'Connor. Connie is the Education Director of the Cincinnati Nature Center. The Cincinnati Nature Center has 1,800 acres for nature lovers to explore and connect thousands more to nature through online learning programs, social media, and news and e-newsletters. So I will now turn it over to Connie. Thank you, Angela. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, we have a wonderful video that can show a little bit more about the Nature Center than I could possibly explain. All right, so yeah, that's that's us. That's the Cincinnati Nature Center. And, um, you know, uh, like it said in the video, 1,800 acres, and they're all, you know, contiguous acres. Well, we have two properties, one in Long, at Long Branch Farm and Trails, which is in Goshen, and one between Eastgate and Milford. Um, and our mission, as it was said, was inspiring conservation. But what's really important is that the vision is that people in this region will care, in this greater Cincinnati region will care about nature. They'll know that it matters and they'll be taking action to conserve it. So um, some of our prior relationships with UC have helped us with that because as you could tell, it's mostly about people. Conservation is about people. It's about priming them to care, inspiring them to care, giving them some tools uh, to practice, you know, working on the land and, and taking care of the land um, and uh, in, instilling that environmental ethic. So the Arlet Center, UC's Arlet Center um, has been a, a key partner for us for a long time. They put in a nature playscape the same year that we did. And Dr. Vicki Carr has done a lot of research on how the playscape, um, which is a kind of an intentional place where young children can experience nature, um, sort of like you would in your grandparents back 40 back in the day, kind of no rules, you know, lots of uh, rich diversity of plants and animals and water and mud and everything else. And um, so they put in a playscape, uh, Dr. Ricky Carr put a playscape in at um, near Arlet Center, the Nature Center put one in at the same time. And then she's been studying the playscape affordances or what makes the playscape, um, which elements of the playscape help to promote pre-STEM learning in young children. And it's wonderful the way that they documented children problem solving and working together, um, you know, parallel play, going into collaborative play and trying to kind of communicate with one another to accomplish uh, rolling a log or building a fort or what have you. And um, in addition, our Lit Center sends students to our nature preschool, student teachers to our uh, to our nature preschool 
and they learn how to teach young children in an outdoor environment, which in our opinion is the best place to, uh, to teach young children. Uh, we also have uh, one of Vicki Carr's students, uh, Ann Ross Miller. She's working on um, whether or not nature-based environmental learning at a young age impacts preteens and their connection to nature. And if so, what type of early learning experiences are most likely to carry through to the preteen right before adolescence, like 10 years old type of thing, 10, 11. Um, of course, we also have scientific research going on uh, with uh, UC and also with NKU. Uh, we have a native seed propagation program that NKU is studying to figure out the best way to harvest milkweed seeds and other pollinator seeds for sale to other people, what makes them most viable. And we have George Utz from the biology department at UC. He's been studying spiders on our property for 30 years. So. We have a lot of relationships with uh, with UC and the local other local universities and colleges. There's lots of opportunities moving forward um, because what we're really looking at now is that part where we say that we want people to take action for the environment. That's the part that's most challenging because what people think is that nature centers teach people about nature and and somehow or another, that's magically going to turn into people taking action to protect the environment. But what we know about um, behavioral science now is that knowledge does not lead to behavior change at all. Um, and even positive feelings toward nature do not lead toward, to behavior change. Behavior change is its own special thing, right? I mean, anybody that's tried to uh, do any sort of public health campaigns knows that. You can tell people all day long that smoking is bad for them and give them all the facts in the world, but people are not motivated by facts. And so we're trying to figure out how to motivate. We have about 17, 18,000 member households. How can we motivate the folks that really care about nature and probably have um, you know, some knowledge about nature? How do we motivate them to use their voice for conservation? That's the challenge. And when we're talking about using our voice, um, I mean beyond private action. So private action, um, it's really important, right, that you limit your carbon emissions by driving less, um, you know, uh, planting native plants and, and uh, you know, things like that, uh, recycling and eating less beef, all of those things, flying less, all the things that we know, reducing food waste, all of those things as an individual can make a difference. Also consumer actions like boycotting companies that are, you know, um, doing unethical practices as part of uh, their consumer uh, products. So that's great. But then you need to motivate other people to do the same thing because these are collective action problems. So one person making a difference isn't going to make a difference. So how do you influence the people in your social circles? Getting people to talk to one another and practice civil discourse with people who might not agree, but people that they know, family members, relatives, uh, teachers of their, you know, teachers, neighbors, uh, people like that. How do you get them motivated to take, to take the same actions that you're taking? And then finally, how do you speak to power? How do you address corporations and, um, you know, change legislation when, you know, that's the only way forward. And the answer is you have to do all three. We find a lot of our members probably stop it at one, which is, you know, it's easy to take action on your own land relatively, but when you're trying to influence others to do the same and even trying to influence the structure in which decisions are made, it takes a lot more, um, I would say social support because it's not fun. It's, it's actually kind of the opposite of fun. Right. And so how do you get people excited about doing the right thing when it's not the easy thing? <laughs> that's like the age old question for every social problem. Right. And that's what the nature center is trying to figure out what to do, how to do that. Now um, there is, sorry about the cat. There is a uh, lots, uh, th there's lots of opportunities to study um, how we are trying to promote behavior change within our organization. One more thing to keep in mind is our members are not joining us for the same reason they would join the Ohio Environmental Council or the Sierra Club. They're not joining us to become activists. They're joining us for recreation. I think that was probably pretty obvious in the video. So you have people who just want to forget about all the responsibilities of the world, come to the Nature Center to relax and enjoy their experience in nature, and on top of that, I'm trying to excite them about the idea of taking action to make sure that nature sticks around without making them feel like 
it's just a big Debbie Downer to hear from the nature center. There's a lot of finesse involved with the uh, communication and the uh, social uh, support that we give people as we're trying to build this. Uh, basically, we're community organizing our own community, but we're not telling them what to do. We're just saying whatever conservation issues you're interested in, use your voice. And in fact, then we connect them to places like Green Umbrella, who you'll hear from Ryan soon here, because they already have these um, local action teams uh, up and, and running. So if we can come up with a way to feed into that, then that would be a great success for us. And I think there's lots of opportunities to, uh, to get involved with research and to support what we're doing. Thank you very much, Connie. That, that was wonderful. So of course, if we were in person right now, you'd hear a big round of, of applause from, from all of the, the guests here. So guests, I'll mention that you do have access to your little virtual picture of clapping hands if, if you feel like, like um, thinking Connie that way. Otherwise, I'll, I'll thank her on all of our behalf. Um, uh, okay, so next up, our next speaker is Oliver Croner. Ollie is the Sustainability Manager for the City of Cincinnati. His work focuses on climate science and urban policy, including energy, transportation, waste, and food systems. Ali leads collaboration of government and community partners to advance and track the sustainability, equity, and resilience strategies of the Green Cincinnati Plan. Like Angela said, our office is really focused, laser focused on the climate crisis and how it will impact city government and day-to-day -day operations, how it will impact quality of life for our residents, and what we can do about it. And to give a quick lay of the land, you know, the climate crisis looks differently here in Cincinnati than it does in many other parts of the world. And we're not dealing with the hurricanes and forest fires and sea level rise. We're dealing with increases in surface heat temperatures, uh, increases in pest species, but primarily increases in storm events. Uh, we call them 100 year storms, storms that are statistically supposed to happen once every 100 years. We're now seeing uh, several over the last five years on top of our 50 year storms, on top of our 25 year storms. So, anybody studying statistics, uh, you can help us correct this math because the math is changing. And as you know, Cincinnati is very hilly. So, when we experience these storm events, it runs down the hills creates flash flooding. Uh, when the hills become saturated, we see landslides. This image right here is Columbia Parkway, which you're probably familiar with. That landslide blocked traffic. And just earlier this year, we wrapped up a $17 million hillside stabilization project that we hope will prevent future challenges. But that $17 million comes out of the city government's budget that could pay for other things, other core governmental services. So this, this is a problem that is here now impacting our day-to-day -day government. And I'm sure you are all familiar with our local sewer system, the fact that we have a combined sewer system that is easily overwhelmed when we have these storm events and that can create combined sewer overflows that pumps raw sewage into people's backyards, into public waterways, in some cases, into people's homes via sewer backups. Very nasty problem that is unpleasant, but also has long-term health implications when you have that volume of moisture inside a, a home. So this is hundreds of millions of dollars of storm damages that we can now attribute to the climate crisis. So this is a problem that is here now, impacting government, impacting quality of life. So what do we do about it? Well, Cincinnati has long been planning and preparing for the climate crisis back since 2008, when we adopted our first climate action plan, build the green Cincinnati plan. We measured how much carbon emissions we produce as a city and set long-term reduction targets and outlined a handful of strategies to help us achieve those. And as you might imagine, the science of climate is rapidly evolving. The policies and politics available are changing and the technologies continue to mature. So we have found the need to update the plan on a five-year basis. So we up to update for next year. So I'll talk a little bit more about that here momentarily. 
one of the key roles of our office is actually modeling the carbon emissions we generate as a city. So when we think about the environmental crisis, there are a lot of different components of it, uh, some of which Connie touched on. When we zoom in on carbon emissions, it helps us strategize our approach to decarbonizing Cincinnati. So you can see here, cars and transportation account for about a third of our emissions. And then buildings, our residential buildings, industrial buildings, and commercial buildings account for about 60%. So you think about the, the fossil fuels that we use to power our cars, to heat and cool our buildings. And that's really the bulk of where our carbon comes from. But that's important data that gives shape to our strategy. So the Green Cincinnati Plan is really a community vision for what a sustainable, equitable, resilient future looks like for the city of Cincinnati. And I'm only gonna touch on it lightly here and then get into some areas where our work overlaps and we partner with universities in the region. Um, but at the center of this is a pretty extensive community engagement process. We held over 30 public meetings around the city. I hope, I know many of you participated in those. Uh, we collected over 1,400 different recommendations from the public on how to address the environmental crisis and the climate crisis here. Then we partnered with UC to analyze the carbon reduction potential of the recommendations we received. And we partnered with Xavier University to conduct a cost benefit analysis of the highest impact strategies. And all in all, we presented 80 strategies to city council for consideration. They, those 80 touch on the different focus areas you see, see here and help us achieve an 80% reduction in our carbon emissions by 2050, building on those three themes that I've touched on. In building a community vision, we are really doing our best to catalyze collective impact. I think we're all aware the climate crisis is an all hands on deck problem. And the scope of the work here is far bigger than our office can take on, far bigger than city government can take on. So along the way, different organizations across the community have put their name down next to different strategies, serving as champions to help see the work come to life. So this is a variety of those organizations. This list has continued to grow, but you can see some of our local universities are key partners here. And collaboration with universities can take different shapes. Some of them are very pragmatic. Uh, many of you probably know Daniel Hart at UC. His office partnered with our office in some of the uptown waste diversion efforts. So as you might imagine, during the big move out week for campus, there's quite a bit of waste generated. And through our collaboration, we create some strategies to help divert as much of that waste from the landfill as possible. So our recycling team was present to receive recyclables. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul was present to help direct some of those reusable goods to uh, the thrift store rather than the landfill. And I, I don't have the data before me, but this is many tons of waste that don't go to landfill, they go to further use. But most of our work is more research oriented when it comes to university partnerships. Um, you know, we're coming out of a public health pandemic, I hope. Uh, we're, we're at a stage where we can look back and say, who was vulnerable to this crisis? What worked and what didn't? Um, what are the long-term implications? And in many ways, the climate crisis is uh, presenting a, a parallel path here where we now have a better understanding of how the crisis will impact certain pockets of our community differently than others based on socioeconomic factors, based on demographic factors, based on where within the city you live. So I'll hat tip Miami University who helped in the early stages of some of our urban heat mapping. And that's a map you see here on the left. Um, helped give some sense to where we are experiencing concentrations of heat during heat events. Um, but that work has evolved and we've partnered very closely with uh, both Green Umbrella, Groundwork Ohio and the University of Cincinnati, um, the lab of Dr. Carly Trott 
and developing our first ever climate equity indicators report. So this is a collection of 55 different metrics that help us understand more specifically, more granularly, where in the city we are experiencing different climate risks, who in the city uh, is experiencing these risks, how do they manifest from one community to another. And we can use that data to better target our resources, better target our policy design. That's available on our website and probably also you see if you look for it, climate equity indicators report. I'm only gonna to touch on this slightly because I imagine Kelsey and Groundwork will dive deeper, but one of our key partnerships is the Climate Safe Neighborhoods work where based on that data and the climate indicators report, how do we then do deep dives within a community to develop community resilience plans? And so the Climate Safe model engages a small collection of community members and pays them for their lived experience uh, around the climate crisis. So, you know, I think academics in particular, no offense, can be sometimes in the sky and fairly abstract in the evaluation and analysis. And I'll include myself in that, you know, when we're thinking at a city level, our data can lead us in different directions than we're thinking at a community level. And so we've come to understand that the people closest to the problems are often closest to the solutions. And these workshops that are held over six to eight weeks help us understand specifically where we have problems and specifically where we need trees, where we need cooling stations, where we could have improvements to bus shelters, et cetera. I'll leave the rest to Kelsey on that one. And then when we get into program and policy design, uh, and when we measure equity, one of our key metrics is energy poverty and energy burden, which is the percentage of utilities, household, sorry, the percentage of household income spent on utilities. And national studies show that Cincinnati has among the highest rates of energy poverty in the country. So we're trying to design programs to address this, but we've come to realize that our grasp of our own building stock is fairly limited. We don't know much about our building typology, uh, how they're heated and cooled, uh, how many units are in buildings. And we partnered with Dr. Amanda Webb to do quite a bit of research around this building inventory, helping us understand what of our buildings were built during different eras and what the likely energy efficiency strategies are uh, that we would like to roll out and then measure the impact of different energy efficiency improvement strategies. So that's really helped us make leaps and bounds in micro-targeting specific buildings that are energy legged. Before I step here, I, you know, I'm only touching on a few examples. There are many more. I saw Dr. Alan White uh, in the chat earlier. Um, I'm sitting below one of his food maps in our office right now. I hope Ryan at Green Umbrella will talk about the 2030 district, which is a cross-sector collaboration where we partner with uh, Tiffany at NKU. And we partner with Andy at UC. Bring the experts at different organizations together to, to think through how we can collectively achieve some of this climate action. Now, as we move forward, we now have a motion from our city council to update the Green Cincinnati plan for adoption next year. And we are mapping a fairly extensive community engagement process to try to tap into the collective expertise of the city. We will lean heavily on our academic partners, um, but we are initiating what will be a very intense community engagement session. And there will be many opportunities for partnership evaluation of different strategies. We would very much like to have uh, the academic rigor behind the strategies to map our carbon neutrality, to map our equity work moving forward. So that is our work in a nutshell. If you would like to keep in touch through the 2023 Green Society Plan development process, please visit greensocietyplan.org. We actually have a climate survey there right now and an opportunity to share your suggestions for what should be considered as part of that plan. And I'll hand it over. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, that was wonderful. And again, I'll invite everyone to imagine all of us clapping. Um, 
um, for Ollie if we were in person while, while I uh, thank, uh, thank, thank him on our behalf. So next up, uh, we have Melinda Kruger. Melinda is Executive Director of Confluence Water Technology Innovation Cluster. Confluence is a concentration of interconnected organizations that work together to promote economic growth and technological innovation in the water space in order to harness water technology innovation in Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky, and Southeast Indiana. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to have a chance to tell you a little bit about Confluence. So, um, Confluence is, as Angela pointed out, it's a consortia. And I think most people are surprised to learn that um, Cincinnati is unique and that we have this 100 year plus history of water technology. And um, it started in 1913, actually right up by UC. They were looking for E. coli in the water. So the first lab was developed here, the first federal funding was here, and it just has continued uh, through this history, what, 109 years now. And um, we have developed this suite of assets that's just, uh, it's remarkable. And a lot of times if you're traveling to international uh, conferences for water, you're always surprised when you run into a PhD. So many times they came through Cincinnati or through EPA, but through Cincinnati at some at some point. So uh, if you look at um, on our little timeline here, 2011, Cincinnati was developed and it was developed by um, actually, it was the US EPA, and I just want to give a little shout out to Michelle Laffam. She is from the EPA, and one of, they're one of our, our strongest partners and kind of how we came about. So the US EPA in around 2010 was looking around the country because they realized that we were going to have some very serious issues about water. They looked around for areas where you did have that concentration of expertise, like a Silicon Valley you know, would have in, in computer technology. And they realized that it was right here in their backyard. So we were thrilled, they pulled it together, you know, back in, in 2010, 2011, um, I became ED and we have just had this, this marvelous development of partnerships and uh, part of it is because of this rich suite of assets we had. So first of all, if you are in this market, I mean, or in technology, you need to test that technology. And we know again, water is, is currently and will continue to be as we hear every day, and the awareness is growing daily, that is gonna be one of our biggest challenges. And Oliver touched on a lot of this as well. So we have testing facilities here. We have the Testing and Evaluation Center at the USCBA. We have the fill stream, um, that bottom right slide, uh, testing center out, um, out east by Harsha Lake. And we also have thousands of miles of rivers and streams. So we have all this testing capability, but what we also look for are what are our challenges. So we all remember Flint, which brought top of mind, you know, what we deal with, with lead service lines and, and providing, you know, we've got to have, you know, clean drinking water for everyone. So this really brought the attention and we are so fortunate. The US EPA has an incredible lab here. And what we did was we brought together experts. So we put together a lead safe Cincinnati team and that includes Children's Hospital, the Cincinnati Health Department, Greater Cincinnati Waterworks, and of course UC. And Confluence coordinating to, to look for solutions. We have a white paper, you know, we've kind of had to slow the process a little bit with COVID because everyone got at Children's and Health Department got very busy. But this is something that we are working on, continue to work on. And as you know, infrastructure dollars are coming, we really have pulled together a team and are working on technologies that would address this. Uh, just a quick example would be that we're looking for a technology that you know would determine what is a lead service line so that you don't have to dig it up, that you would be imagine a handheld that you would go over the ground and it would be able to tell you, is it wood, is it you know, uh, PVC, what would that be? So we gather experts around a challenge and look for solutions in technology. Another thing that came up, this is a few years ago, I don't know if everybody remembers Toledo, and they had, uh, what, 500,000 people, no water for four days. So we pulled together an algotoxin summit that, at that point, and that was to be able to really provide a, a model that would help our utilities plan for uh, a microcystin uh, concentration contamination. So we put together a program, again, 
it's collaboration, it's partnerships. So we wound up having, uh, we worked with NASA, we worked with UC, uh, Central State, Ball State, or Senko, and we put together a great program that uh, we used at Harsha Lake, trying to capture, you know, in just, you know, one moment, uh, hyperspectral data, ground truth things, songs, and all the different technology uh, monitors and to, to, to get a picture of how we can uh, predict this. So sure enough, just a few days later, we had a 600 mile balloon coming down the Ohio River. So NASA calls, we uh, get the boat, we get the team together, and we were out and we were able to catch capture this data, uh, multi-level and, you know, part of it with every, was that everybody had to share. But again, every brought, everyone brought different expertise. We had Xylem who brought SAN. So this is something that, you know, it is, it is bringing everyone together, you know, the conditions, everybody share your data, and then, you know, looking for solutions to that. So we, you know, and again, as Oliver said, there, there are new uh, challenges coming every day. So what we found when we had the Alga Toxin Summit right after the uh, Toledo situation, we called everybody together to say, where were you? What did you do? Why did it look flag for you? And then we had all the utilities and we said, tell us you know, what you're doing. So the utilities, um, they came and they were gonna present at one o'clock and we had the Ohio EPA, the US EPA. We had some reporters there and everybody was in and they just came and said, we're really concerned about this you know, sharing all this information and where we were, we, you know, are concerned somebody might come back and say, you, you did what? <laughs> so what happened was we put them together in a room, they presented as a group instead of individually, and it was wonderful. And what they ask after they, they love the platform. And so we created the regional utility network. So this is something that we pull the utilities together to hear directly from them, what are your challenges? And, you know, again, we're talking, this is a unique group because we're talking drinking water, wastewater, storm, reclamation. Um, so they also learn from each other, but they share data specifics, budgets, what the widget looks like, what they need. And this uh, for vendors and others is just key because they also, the, our utilities, which are incredibly forward thinking and we're so fortunate to have them, they do test, they do all this, but they're so busy. And with the challenges that we have, they're all so, so busy that having a chance and sitting down with a, someone that's got a new technology, it's, it's really a challenge for them, you know, just time-wise. So we act as kind of the gatherer, the, uh, the person, the, the unit that just kind of convenes, convenes the, the vendors and utilities to, to identify those challenges. So that has been just a wonderful growing uh, aspect of partnership for us. And also because we had the, the success we had with the, um, the regional utility network and what we did was we created a reverse pitch so that we had the utilities they presented instead of the vendors. And with this reverse pitch, they gave all this, you know, the very specific specifics of the problems that they had presented the vendors came. And then we had, and we have this annually, a tech showcase where all the startups and technologists, large and small businesses came together to present their solutions. And you gave away a W prize at the end of this. And we, walk, we wound up with four winners that partnered with our utilities to test their, uh, their technologies. So that is one of the biggest thing, as we know in so many organizations, as we're talking about this, that it, it, tend, it can be very siloed. And uh, to bring together you know, all the different entities that have an effect on this and have that discussion is just you know, very important. So with the success of the Regional Utility Network, we looked at our universities and oh my goodness, well, uh, you know, obviously that's where, um, where the talent is and the future is. So we created the Water Research Consortium. So this was also to connect universities so that they would be able to know what another university would be working on as far as PFAS and solutions, remediation, and uh, what they're working on on sensors and lead sensors, let's say. So that has really been helpful. And what we did was we created um, a water research or WRC challenge. So we put together, uh, we have an innovation grant fund. And so we used that and we, you know, had a call for abstracts and had all the, the universities come together and present. So, you know, again, that has been another great way to convene 
communicate. Uh, and also with the universities and partnering and with the utilities, you know, you, there's a trust that builds. And as that conversation develops, it's really been uh, it's such a, a learning for everyone. So I just, you know, want to kind of come back and, and talk about, you know, kind of the, the vision mission of, of Confluence. But, you know, our region is a global leader in sustainable water technology and innovation. And what we look to do is to identify, develop, test, commercialize innovative technology to serve environmental challenges for sustainable economic development and job creation, which is just so huge for our utilities. Um, we look to develop, test, and commercialize technologies. We want to, because we have so many assets, attract the best and brightest students and entrepreneurs to this region. And we also are looking to promote economic development through the creation and attraction of jobs and investment. When we look at the economic impact of the technologies that we are looking to develop and bring to market, the investment, uh, I think it was even annually, it's like 2.4 billion. Um, and that is, and we, that is growing six to 8% a year. So, and that's not a recent number. So I'm sure it's even more, you know, considering the events of today. So we also want to be the source of practical and affordable solutions and sustainable practices for water in our region. With that, it's also, you know, it's, we're all talking about oil, but water, that's our liquid gold. You know, we you can't drink oil. <laughs> and we know so the amount of time and energy and crisis is happening globally in our West, you know, with water scarcity, that is not our issue. We have and look to be the models say that we're going to even be getting wetter, which will, you know, cause more of some of the other, you know, dramatic rain events and so forth. But, you know, it's just a one, I want just, I hope, I hope it's a point of pride for everybody that we have this incredible intellectual capacity in this market and uh, just such an opportunity right here. So I'll wrap up, up with that. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, and uh, on behalf of, of everyone listening, I know. Okay, so um, our next speaker is Kelsey Hawkins Johnson. Kelsey is Community Outreach Coordinator for Groundwork Ohio River Valley. Groundwork Ohio River Valley develops community-based partnerships that empower people, businesses, and organizations to promote environmental, economic, and social well-being. Hello, my name is Kelsey. I am with Groundwork Ohio River Valley. We are an environmental nonprofit based in Lower Price Hill, where we work with youth, as well as we do environmental restoration work, um, as well as uh, we have a green team, Green Corps, uh, who do uh, urban restoration and conservation work in the community. And so with Groundwork, we uh, employ youth as well as young adults to uh, build and become in like green careers. And we also, when we work with youth, we work with them who are left behind in the environmental movement. And so with Groundwork, we have many ways and opportunities for universities as well as students and faculty to be involved uh, within our work. And so one of the programs that we have is youth development. We also have climate resiliency programs. And then lastly, we have citizen science. Um, in the below graph is our build work dashboard, which was created actually by a University of Cincinnati alum, uh, Sarah Morgan, who is our GIS manager. And we also have interns from uh, DAP who are working to update that field work dashboard. So today I'm going to talk about our programs and ways for engagement for not just university students, but also researchers and faculty who may be interested in volunteering or being uh, more engaged within our work. And so first off, I just want to explain uh, the Green Team program. And so the Green Team is for high schoolers between the ages of 14 and 18 who get prepared, to, who get prepared in a field of conservation and um, uh, in the green workforce. And so on the left side here is students who went to Yellowstone National Park as a part of uh, a part of their work. And so they not only work, they also gain skills in natural resource management. They learn how to build uh, bridges and trails. And so it was a 
opportunity for youth who not who were not able to uh, go to a national park for the first time to be able to uh, get this experience. They were also led by our youth leader and youth leader assistants who um, I'll be talking more about here. And so what we like to say is, you know, conservation work is justice work. And when it comes to the green team, there is a lot of intersecting parts. And so there's income. So we pay our youth to do trail building. Uh, they do gardening work, uh, also urban agriculture, as well at our Green Learning Center in Madisonville. And so this is a paid opportunity for them to work within their community, um, as well as to gain the skills of being employed and what it's like to work in the green sector. And again, there's an opportunity for that and then equity. A lot of the youth that we work with are not, are not so much in the environmental movement, they're most likely left behind. Um, and so this is an opportunity to introduce them through like environmental education to the conservation field and to the environment. So no one is left behind. And so that's where equity comes in. So for ways to engage, so youth leader and youth leader assistants, these are our, uh, they most likely are our university students and they work with the youth to go to sites such as Cincinnati Zoo and um, Great Parks and they work with them and, uh, it, and support their development. They teach their environmental education. And so on the right hand side is Jada who is actually a university alum from Northern Kentucky and she is a youth leader. She also started off with groundwork as an intern. And so there's many ways to become an intern as well as work as a youth leader and youth leader assistant. If, if working like in the field and natural resource management as well as with youth is something that you're interested in. Another one of our programs is the Green Corps. And so our Green Corps is uh, for ages uh, 18 to 24, and these are our young adults. And so we'd like to say it's like a step up from Green Team. So the Green Team, they do trail building and community gardening, but um, for the Green Corps, they do more uh, construction, more labor intensive work, uh, such as dealing with uh, tractors, as well as more uh, labor intensive uh, work through like invasive species removal. Um, and so they also get cert certifications within green infrastructure. So that looks like uh, clean water certification. Uh, they also permaculture uh, certification as well. And so there's opportunities if you're not ready for like college or like just getting ready for that, then this is an opportunity to build more of your skills as well as learn and work on a team um, within this program. Next one of our programs is our blue team. So I'd like to say this is more of like our citizen science team. And this is in partnership with the Little Miami Conservancy. So we had students uh, work on the blue team to uh, do water quality monitoring of the Little Miami River. And they work with SONS, which is in the photo here where they were able to pick up uh, like particle matter and uh, different water particles that are in a little Miami. And then lastly, one of our other programs that um, is in like the citizen science field is air quality. And we've had UC students recently uh, do installations uh, within Lower Price Hill. And this is in partnership with Cincinnati Children's as well as the Euler Community Learning Center where they were able to uh, uh, install and do and monitor the air quality systems. And this was, so UC students, they were part of a environmental justice class who is partnering with Groundwork to introduce the students to uh, community work in regards to environmental justice. And so over here is AJ who helped out uh, Tori and Jada, and they're both also university alums. And also they started off as interns. So if this is like the route that you're interested in, such as an internship or volunteering, uh, there are multiple ways to be plugged in for that. And then next, I wanted to talk about climate safe neighborhoods. So climate safe neighborhoods is in partnership with the Office of Environment Sustainability, uh, 
green umbrella and then the University of Cincinnati, who is doing data and evaluation of our Lower Price Hill, Lower Price Hill Climate Advisory Group and then our Bond Hill and Rose Lawn Climate Advisory Group. And so Climate Safe Neighborhoods, the mission is to uh, advance resident voices in regards to climate resiliency, as well as to talk about and discuss institutionalized racism and how that connects with the climate crisis as well. And so we're thankful for our partnership with the University of Cincinnati, who is doing um, evaluation on this. And uh, Dr. Kali Tra and her team is the one who is doing that. Um, it's very beneficial to know the impact of the climate advisory group process. And then here we have pictured uh, university students from DAP who participated in a Lower Price Hill tree planting, as well as a map of like Lower Price Hill and what does that look like in particular. So we have worked with university students who uh, volunteered and also in the picture here is Kyle, who is uh, an intern with us. And I also had the pleasure of uh, working with Kyle to go to a, to a national park up in Chillicothe with youth for a field trip. And so um, in regards to climate safe neighborhoods in Lower Price Hill, uh, the Lower Price Hill Climate Advisory Group, which is a paid focus group of residents who are dedicated to their community, who want to see change and who are interested in um, creating a climate resiliency plan. Um, that's what just came out of this. And so with the Lower Price Hill Climate Advisory Group, they identified the lack of trees within their area. And so not only are we working with the Lower Price Hill Community Council to uh, implement more tree canopy in Cincinnati parks, but we also have worked on the ground with residents in the Lower Price Hill Green Team, as well as students to um, implement the implement the trees within the community. And this was through the uh, green, the relief program with the Cincinnati Parks. And also we had a community service uh, day with Xavier University uh, at our Green Learning Center. So there are multiple ways of like volunteering and that could look like community gardening, uh, working with raised beds or uh, tree planting through our climate resiliency projects. And then I would like to also note this was created by our GS manager, Sarah. And lastly, I want to talk about um, uh, from citizen science to student planning. Uh, so here on the left-hand side, we have World Town Planning Day. Uh, this was also in collaboration with Green Umbrella and the American Planning Association. And there were students from Miami University and the University of Cincinnati uh, planning department who came to this event to learn more about the Roseland and Bond Hill Climate Advisory Group and create a uh, and create a plan in regards to the different topics that were talked about. So uh, some of the topics was food systems, green space, as well as um, uh, sustainable infrastructure. We also have here on the right-hand side, Alyssa Lee Share in Avondale. So I also had the pleasure of working with university students who um, part of the environmental justice class participate in a listen, lead, share. And this picture was actually taken from a university student. And when I worked with the students, they took notes as well as engaged with the residents about, um, about environmental justice and clean energy within a community. So there are ways for students to plug in, but also faculty and planners and professionals to be a part of the climate resilience, climate resiliency projects and uh, plants that we're working on in collaboration with OES and Green Umbrella. And so I just want to conclude that um, there are multiple ways of engagement as well as, and that looks like volunteering as well as employment. So uh, Jada, Tori, a lot of our interns, they were university students. They were employed by Groundwork and we also have youth leader and youth leader assistants who are also employed through Groundwork to lead our youth development programs. And so if you have any questions or if you would like to get more involved with our youth development programs, be involved with our climate resiliency projects, research, 
um, as well as with citizen science that we have with the blue team and air quality, uh, feel free to contact me. I have my information here on the slide, as well as follow us on social media in our newsletter. We also tend to uh, post uh, extra volunteer opportunities and um, other ways of engagement. So thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to the breakout rooms. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, that was fascinating uh, and, and had a lot, um, a lot of opportunities uh, that you outlined. Um, our final speaker is Ryan Mooney Bullock. Ryan is executive director of Green Umbrella, which we've already heard mentioned um, in at least a couple of the presentations so far. Green Umbrella serves as the Regional Sustainability Alliance of Greater Cincinnati with hundreds of member organizations and individuals passionate about enhancing the environmental health and vitality of our region. It's been fun to hear all of the exciting things that are going on, I, a lot of which I know about, but also thinking about how they all connect into research and university partnerships. So I'll add a little bit uh, to the context. Um, Green Umbrella is the Regional Sustainability Alliance for Greater Cincinnati. We're a member-based organization that has over 200 member organizations of all kinds involved, and all of the major universities in Greater Cincinnati are members of Green Umbrella. Um, and so that's one first point of connection. Um, but we are really focused on facilitating collaboration that has the end result of uh, changing policies, systems, and environmental conditions that will really allow all of our partner organizations and our local governments to work more effectively and achieve more results when it comes to environmental quality, sustainability, climate action. And so we have very much this like policy level work, systems change work, uh, and a lot of the, the heart of what we do is around bringing together many, many partners who kind of have different perspectives on an issue or a challenge uh, and getting them to share all of their unique perspectives so that we can tackle that challenge effectively and, and really hope for some significant change. Um, so first of all, if you don't already know, Green Umbrella manages a green jobs board, which is the place to go if you are looking for internships, full-time positions, part-time positions with any environmental nonprofit or organization, public agency that's related to uh, green or environmental issues. They almost all post their jobs there. So that's a great resource to know about. We also have a membership directory that has cool information about our more than 200 members. And so if you're trying to learn more about like what other organizations are out there that you might wanna partner with, that could be a good jumping off point just to see what's out there and uh, who potential collaborators might be for your research or other work that you're trying to do. We have um, a number of different programs that we support as a part of Green Umbrella. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the ways that they have participated with university partners um, in the past. So our Cincinnati 2030 district is a, 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 a network of high performing buildings. So buildings that have committed to reporting their data to uh, make progress towards 50% reductions in energy use, water use, and transportation emissions by the year 2030. UC, NKU, and Xavier are all members of the 2030 district and university buildings represent the largest building footprint within the district. So it's a really huge part of that effort. Um, sustainability coordinators like Tiffany Budd at NKU and Daniel Hart at UC have been really key in advocating for those universities to become a part of the district to make sure that they're reporting their data annually and that they're figuring out what can we do to help make progress towards those goals. Um, so they have been key connectors into facilities departments, architecture departments, professors, and more um, just to make sure that there's actual impact coming out of that work. We also have a number of working groups that are focused on those four different pillars that you see. Um, and we have representations from all three of those univers institutions, universities on those teams. Um, we also had, you know, earlier on in the launch of the district, Nancy Berteau at Xavier incorporated research and analysis of the potential impact of the 2030 district into one of her economics courses, uh, which really gave us some interesting insight as we were getting launched. Another key part of the launch of the 2030 district was Amanda Webb at UC, whose analysis of like building by building, uh, size, energy performance, 
uh, other key factors really helped us understand the potential impact of the 2030 district, particularly in large downtown buildings, and helped us to understand what top priority buildings uh, for recruitment um, and for like kind of natural fit or uh, more challenging buildings, but that would really be impactful to bring on board. And she's continued and her students have continued to work with us. Um, they have done energy audits in city of Cincinnati fire departments. Um, they have helped make the case for Cincinnati joining a national coalition that's focused on, on getting large buildings to commit to further progress. So happy to have her work uh, along, along with us. And also uh, there's definitely potential for but lots more research related to this work. You know, we have a, a ton of data that we're collecting. Um, we just started collecting data on commuting behavior related to 2030 district buildings. And uh, we just brought on board a student from UC to do a project with us to help understand uh, and really communicate the results of our first transportation survey and what we can learn from it. We also manage Tri-State Trails, which is working to connect people and places with a regional trail and bikeway network. Um, it conducts a trail monitoring program every year that looks at the usage of trails across the region. And Dr. Na Chen from UC's School of Planning has really been critical in helping establish that methodology and do that analysis each year. Um, we've also had support from UC School of Planning on a studying and kind of doing concept mapping and potential uh, route analysis of a number of trail corridors, especially the Mill Creek corridor lately. Uh, Xavier University is actively helping us to connect the Crown Trail, uh, part of Wasson Way, part of the Crown Trail through their campus. Um, and we've hosted trail summits at universities, including UC, and are hoping to host it at NKU this fall. Um, we also know that students can be awesome advocates for more safe, uh, active transportation. And we saw uh, their voices at work at UC um, over the last six months in advocating for uh, the continued use of the um, temporary bike lane on Clifton Avenue. So it's exciting to see students speaking up and uh, sharing their passion for safe, environmentally friendly ways to get around our community. We also um, support the Greater Cincinnati Regional Food Policy Council, which is working to create a healthy, equitable, and sustainable food system for all. We have been working with um, Christ College faculty member Alan White to create, promote, and publish the Food Shed Atlas, which is telling the story of Cincinnati's food system, past, present, and future. So keep an eye out for that forthcoming. A number of local artists, Mappers and other um, students and professors have contributed content to that awesome coffee table book. Um, we've also been working with OSU faculty on um, some really exciting policy work related to farm to school spending flexibility. Um, and we've also worked in the past with Frank Russell in DAP at uh, doing some research and evaluation work related to our food system. There's a lot of potential growth here. Uh, we've just uh, met for the first time with UC's new Net Impact student group and are excited to explore its interest in entrepreneurship and sustainability and how that can connect into our local food system, um, as well as Miami University's Institute for Food, which is really thinking about where it can go and, and what role it can play in the region. Um, I would say that we have done a lot more data analysis and evaluation over the last year, thanks to um, Maddie Chera joining our team. She's the new director of the Food Policy Council, um, but came on board in an, in an analyst role. Um, and so I think we have like started the process of really understanding what more we could learn and understand about our local food system. And so for folks who are interested in this work, I definitely encourage you to reach out to her or I'd be happy to connect you. We have um, work that we're supporting through the CPS Outside Impact Team that's working to ensure district-wide um, outdoor environmental education for all students in Cincinnati Public Schools. And we've really had key support from um, UC through the Arlett Center and the College of Education, Criminal Justice and Human Services. We have folks from both of those uh, departments on our impact team working groups. 
Um, they've helped us, you know, do literature reviews on the benefits of outdoor learning and play for kids so we can really make the case to the community for why this is so important to invest in. Um, and also shared amazing professional development resources for teachers. But we think that that can go so much further. We would love to see universities incorporate outdoor teaching skills into their curriculum for pre-service teachers so that the next generation of teachers in our schools are coming in with a passion and the knowledge of how to do this and how to incorporate outdoor learning and play into all aspects of their curriculum at all age levels, um, because we really see it as crucial to healthy human development, but also as Connie touched on before to start to create that care for the natural world, which may not lead to behavior change, but at least when it started young enough can uh, head us in the right direction. Um, this is, an, is a little bit of a data black hole for us right now in the sense that we are just starting to um, think about the possibilities of expanded outdoor green spaces and, and learning and play spaces on school campuses um, and would love to hear from folks who would be interested in, in thinking about an evaluation and data collection approach that would really help us understand um, what the possibilities are here. There is amazing data nationally and you know from cities across the world really um, but in terms of measuring our impact within one school district we'd be excited to to think more about this collectively and then finally we have a agriculture education curriculum advisory committee um, that includes representatives from both uc and cincinnati state and we're excited to hear from them about what types of career pathways we might start uh, making sure are available within our schools so that students are accessing those resources early on, um, kind of tying into what Kelsey was speaking about earlier. <clears throat> and we also support the Common Orchard Project, which is growing fresh fruit and green space um, in urban spaces. It's on track to plant 15 commonly held orchards a year. Um, and these sites don't just protect or don't just provide fresh fruit, but they also create green space. They sequester about two and a half tons of carbon over their lifetime for each orchard and absorb 500 gallons of water during each rain event. Um, those are projections. If anybody wants to come along for the ride to help us actually quantify those, that would be exciting. And a recent co-op from DAP helped us create an amazing story map that you can find on the website there, commonorchard.com slash the story um, that talks about how this work got started and what it is and what it's gonna do for our community. Finally, we have a area of work that we refer to as climate policy. And it is really working to enhance the ability of local governments across our 10 county region, which has three states in it, um, to both prepare for the effects of climate change while they are also reducing their own impacts on climate emissions. And so we are doing a ton of work to build these, bring these partners together. Um, we are excited to be partnering on a social network analysis coming up with Carla Schifos and Daniel Murphy from UC to really like understand Cincinnati's emerging climate network. Um, you've already heard about the work that we've been doing with Groundwork and the city and Carly Trot on the climate advisory groups through climate safe neighborhoods. Um, and we're really trying to make sure that from the start of the regional climate collaborative that we're forming, we have a solid kind of evaluation process to understand if the methods we're using, if the types of outreach we're doing are really making a difference. Um, there's also a huge potential to start documenting the results of this work. So just like the city of Cincinnati has been tracking the um, emissions reductions that they are achieving thanks to the Green Cincinnati Plan, we could be doing something like that across the region that really looks at um, a bunch of different local governments and the regional emissions reductions. And finally, we have one really exciting opportunity in the works, uh, especially for students. We are working to bring <clears throat> the resilience cohort model that the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University has developed um, into our counties in Ohio and Kentucky. And the basic model is that it connects 
specific local governments who apply to participate with a fellow for the summer. So this would be a undergraduate or graduate student who is basically working in-house with a local government over the course of a summer to conduct a series of activities that help them engage in climate action planning and resilience um, planning. And so we are in the process of fundraising right now in order to implement this program in 2023 for the first time for five to 10 local governments. Um, and so that would mean five to 10 fellowships for students um, that could have an awesome experience really getting uh, their hands in local government climate planning and having a huge impact. So please reach out to me if you have funding connections or other ideas um, that will help us bring that work to our region. And finally, you know, any ideas for collaboration or active research, uh, we'd love to hear from you. It's something that we're really uh, focused on continuing to improve how we can not just have policy impact, but really measure um, the impact of the work that we're doing collectively and how it benefits our entire community. Thank you, Ryan, for that really nice overview of all the, the partnership work uh, that, that Green Umbrella does so well. Um, okay, so I also want at this point to thank all of our speakers. Um, it's really, these presentations I think have really provided at least me with a better understanding of the breadth of sustainability part partnership activities and nature of those activities in our region. And it's just re honestly really fascinating to see all the different areas of expertise that researchers, students, and others have brought to this collaborative work. Um, and it's been really interesting sort of uh, path through topics related to that.